Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for logging in. Um, this is uh, the South Carolina Adopt a Stream Engaging Communities uh, webinar, our first time um, going beyond the data and database to talk about the more program impacts and influences. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we'll give everyone another minute um, to get logged in, but thank you for being here. Thank you, Dodi. Good to see you here. We have um, something to catch up with uh, as well. So I'll be in touch with you. And if everyone, I am obsessed and love hummingbirds. That's why there is a hummingbird puzzle on your screen and not like a river, although I'm obsessed with rivers and creeks as well, but <laughs> I'm starting to miss my hummingbirds. Hi, Benjamin. Glad to see you here. I think um, other than Trey, you are our only, uh, maybe our water utility uh, person here today. Is that right? Yes. So um, thank you for joining this conversation. We were just talking about how utilities have such a potential impact for change, to be change makers in our community and, and around watershed stewardship. All right, um, well, we'll go ahead and get started as people continue to jump into the room here with us. Um, I really wanna thank everyone for being here. This is our first time offering this type of webinar. And since announcing it, you know, just this past week, I've heard from others, uh, even in other states who are ready to share their stories of how they use citizen science monitoring to broaden their reach, broaden their possibilities. And that's what this conversation here is really about, or what are your possibilities and what are your vision and how does adopt a stream or your citizen science monitoring program serve you in that vision? We have two really great speakers, Josie Newton from Friends of the Reedy River. And uh, before Josie, we'll hear from Trey Burns with Anderson Regional Joint Water Authority. Trey, you'll have to correct me. I know I got that acronym <laughs> incorrect. Fine. I've, I've been trying to change that for years. But <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we really, uh, also, my name is Katie Callahan. I have the um, very good fortune of working uh, with great people um, at DHEC and at Clemson to administer the South Carolina Adopt-A-Stream program. Um, and so you're hearing uh, from me today and, and Emily Anderson as well is on the screen um, helping us go through our chat room. So thank you, Emily. Um, so welcome again to our very first webinar that's going beyond the data to look at how do you can use your citizen science monitoring program to engage in greater and more inclusive watershed management activities in your community. And I want to make this, even though we're not in the same room together, as interactive of a conversation and energized as a conversation as possible, because we're all here because we're passionate about water resources in some way. I am uh, very passionate and, and almost define myself in terms of how much water activities I do. It it's fills my cup. And so similar to all of you, we have a passion in this industry and an interest in engaging a broader audience and how we long-term protect our water resources, not just for us, but for the next generation. And so today, I, I guess that just real quickly, for those of you um, who are new to South Carolina adopt a stream This program is co-led by Clemson Center for Watershed Excellence in South Carolina DHEC, and it seeks to educate residents in waterway and ecosystem health and engage them in the collection of baseline data collection. That's non-regulatory data collection, but that first and foremost 
impact that we're looking to have is education. And so um, this program is as much about people as it is about waterways and those that live in those waters. This is a people program. And so today we'll talk about what is uh, the potential and the possibilities of how you use this program to reach your audiences. So um, when we talk about possibilities, what is whether you're a watershed organization, a water utility, a city, where do you want to be? That vision statement, right, is about setting up the future. What is the world that you want to live in? What is What do you want to create? Again, not only for you, but for your whole community, for the next generation that will live in your community. And how does citizen science get you there? We do a lot of outreach, right? It's from billboards, commercials, handouts, tabling events. How do we make more of a direct connect with these folks that are, that are interested in water resources or want to get outside and have them help their peers learn more about this program. So um, real quick, just setting the stage for our speakers. There's different goals and that are attained and can be attained from the adopt a stream program or your citizen science monitoring program, whether it's a connection, asking people where does your drinking water come from and building that connection or just what watershed do you live in? How, do you know what watershed runs uh, runs near your neighborhood or in your backyard? Um, creating links between what happens on the land and what you see happening in waterways. So um, not having so much of a, you know, it's behind that kudzu kind of approach, but really what does that waterway look like? And how is that playing a role in flood protection, in biodiversity, in community health, and how is it telling the story about how we're changing the landscape and the impacts on those waterways. And then, of course, teaching about non-point source pollution. Your goals might also be related to action. And in the citizen science program, we, um, in the freshwater system, which has been running, freshwater program, which has been running for four years now, we can uh, look at bacteria monitoring and E. coli, and this is safe for recreation. It's just a marker, you know, for more action by regulatory authority to come out and take additional samples. Um, but there are opportunities to make observations on illicit discharges, illegal dumping, and um, there's several triggers in our database that will send an alert to a local city or county to act upon that data. So these observations are important in creating action. You can also manipulate and use and query the data to talk about conservation priorities for um, protecting areas that are already pristine or responding to areas that need assistance, such as stream bank restoration, addressing waste that you're, vision, that you're seeing in stream or the waste um, that you're monitoring with your E. coli, uh, what kind of waste is, is maybe impacting the health of your waterways and how do you chase that? Um, of course, our E. coli readings don't tell us what animal waste or human waste is in the stream, but having volunteers fill in the gaps and move upstream can really start to highlight what are the potential sources of that bacteria in waterways, uh, monitoring for illegal dumping and creating research. And so on the research note, uh, next month um, in November, we actually have a, our next webinar, we'll be talking about adopt a stream and its use in higher ed. And then brand and accountability. So um, does this program help you build purpose? Does it help you reach new audiences uh, by giving purpose? Are you growing your base, maybe philanthropically, uh, building rapport with your stakeholders, uh, building relationships with city and county that you're in it? You're here with them, monitoring, sharing data, um, creating change in your community uh, so that there's more of a connection with waterways. Um, so just a few things that we will hear more in depth of examples of how adopt stream is being used to broaden those watershed management activities. And so with that, I'm going to uh, switch over to Trey Burns. Um, please feel free to uh, list questions in the chat. Emily and I will be monitoring those. And um, Trey, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And thank you for sharing your story uh, and what your utility does with this program. Thank you, Katie. Everybody seeing and hearing okay? Cool. Well, thanks for having me uh, today. And I apologize, I got to present and then dip. I hate to be rude, but I've actually got another webinar on, on the heels of this one. So I'll spend about uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes kind of explaining how we've really 
adopt and adopt the stream uh, here at our utility. And so I'll unpack what adopting streams on our way to 200,000 source water protectors means, but I actually had no idea about Katie's presentation, but as far as the vision, it's actually the way I'm approaching it. So it works out well, because uh, it really fits into the vision of us creating 200,000 source water protectors uh, because we serve 200,000 people are drinking water. So um, our source, uh, our source is Lake Hartwell. So it's U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Lake, uh, which means we do not own it. And uh, I've heard a lot of conspiracy theories over a lot of drinks over the years of why the Army owns the lakes. So if you ever want to go out for happy hour, I'll be happy to share those, even though I do not subscribe to them. But as of this year, it became the number two most visited Army Corps lake in the country. I think they own about 300 of them. Uh, so it has a lot of traffic. Uh, covers 56,000 surface acres and 962 miles of shoreline, of which we do not own one mile of that. So very challenging when that's our drinking water. But it was a very uh, consistent, very incredible source of drinking water, really no issue. We, the plant was built in 1968 and as far as everything was kind of hunky-dory up until 2013 when the lake looked like this. So the lake turned green. If you were in the Anderson area, you know that the water tasted and smelled really bad for four straight summers. Again, we had never experienced anything like this, so we were unable to remove the taste and odor from the water. And uh, this, my, my uh, position was actually created on the heels of this event. Up until this point, we operated out of sight, out of mind as a utility. Uh, we thought it was a good thing to not be talked about. Well, the only problem with that is when things get bad and then people figure out where it's coming from, because you have no relational equity built up with the community, they, they hate you. That's just that's the bottom line. They don't know who you are, and all of a sudden they figure out who you are, and they don't like you. So it's very hard to communicate with them. Um, and so out of that, though, we really began to reevaluate who we are and how we operate. And so really kind of four revelations from this algae bloom of 2013. The first one, like I shared, people do not know who we are. So as a public utility, that's a problem. Uh, the second revelation was the ones who do know us do not like us. It's very hard to communicate with people um, on a public lake who just don't like you, already have a negative perception of you. Third thing, we need help from the public. And this is a job that is way too big for us to do on our own on this giant lake that covers two different uh, states. And the fourth thing, really the galvanizing moment that gave us hope was that everyone wants clean water. And so it reminded us that we're all on the same team. There's no enemies here. There's no us versus them. So. We went to the whiteboard, uh, literally the whiteboard. I have a weird thing with whiteboards. People like mind maps and brainstorm sessions. I just like whiteboards. I've actually got one right here and another one over there. I just think the best ideas birth from the whiteboard. So one thing I like to talk through an exercise when any kind of project, any kind of job is just ask what if, you know, what if money was no option? What if there were no obstacles? So we started dreaming a little bit and started thinking about what if it wasn't just us protecting the lake? You know, what if we could really engage all 200,000 of our customers? You know, what if all of them started caring passionately about what they put on the ground eventually ends up in their mouth? And even me as a dad of two boys, you know, what if 30 years from now, there are no litter cleanups because there is no litter to clean up. So what if, what if led to, what if we created 200,000 source water protectors? You know, what could our watershed look like? And not, not, not just thinking tomorrow, but 30, 50, 60 years down the road. So as we set off on this journey, the first thing we did was really embrace our identity as a public utility. Uh, this is a sign from the Walgreens Distribution Center. I stole it. They said I could sell it and share it. But as a utility, we really wanted to get rid of this idea of them versus us. I'm sure none of us have ever said it or thought it. Maybe we know someone, know someone but a you know, common language is, you know, they just don't understand. If they would just let us do our jobs, you know, we're the experts, they don't know. And it could happen from public to you know, utility world, but also even within an organization, utility, you know, if maintenance would just understand what we do, the operators don't have a clue. Admin is so detached. They, they, they. So as a public utility, we really want to embrace that it's about us. We all want clean water. We all drink the same water. We all love the lake. And so it's about us. So that really has shaped the way we view ourselves as a public utility. It's not our utility. Yeah, we're paid to run it, but it's all of our utility. And so the, one of the first things we did after embracing that identity was adopt a stream. 
we heard about this uh, back in like that 2017 when I was hired and um, started adopted these four creeks upstream of our intake. This is us down here, Anderson Regional Joint Water. This is the arm of Lake Hartwell we pull our drinking water from. So we did a hydrology study to determine if there's any backflow coming up from the big waters, we like to call it. And uh, there wasn't. So about 80 to 85% of the water that reaches our intake comes from these four creeks. So we adopted them. Uh, started in, starting in 2018, we got 13 different sample sites, really four main ones, but other sites if we detect issues. And since 2018, we've had 122 samples pulled from these four creeks. This is Town Creek, my personal favorite. Um, it just so happens these sampling events always happen when it's 75 and sunny. It's pure coincidence that I get out at beautiful weather. But not only has it led to data now, because as a lot of you probably know, there's not a lot of stream data in South Carolina. So this is, you know, bacteria, there's all the oxygen temperature, connectivity, all the above. So if the lake turns green again, instead of looking at the entire lake body to figure out well, what happened, we have no idea because we have no data. Well, we can look at these four creeks and maybe, hey, the last few months, the last couple of years, one creek's been off is all the oxygen. Let's maybe follow that creek up and figure it, see what we can find. Another value of creating data outside of creating data is just knowing your creeks. So when it was flooding, the massive flooding, I think February of last year, if I remember correctly, we had our sample spots and we just went to observe. And so it's really proved valuable for us to just know our creeks, to view them as just living organisms that change over time and see their flow pattern. So when we go back after the flood, we can see when things are different or not different. And uh, after this flooding, uh, we actually started doing some samples in Hembry Creek, just our monthly sampling, and we found some um, high bacteria levels. So we went to investigate. So this is Hembry Creek. It's our most heavy industrialized, urbanized creek. And we found a high bacteria sample here. You see it way over 1,000 CFU uh, per 100 milliliters. And so we started investigating up the creek and trying to isolate where this bacteria was coming from. And we isolate it to this stretch right here. And so one day, the co-op and I put on our rubber boots and walked the creek. And we actually smelled it before we saw it. And we saw gray water running into the creek. And when we looked over the bank, this is what we saw. You saw it in one of Kelly's, uh, Kelly, um, Katie's presentation earlier. This is obviously a manhole that's supposed to be upright. This is a right away parallel to the creek. And so as you can see, this is an eight inch clay gravity sewer line that has become completely detached. It was dumping around and flowing directly into the creek. We called the entity, they responded immediately and fixed it. Uh, but even let us know that this right away was not scheduled for maintenance for another two to three months. So I'm not certain how many tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of gallons of sewer we were able to prevent just from adopter stream practices again. A lake we don't own, a creek we don't own, but just following the data and getting data. This is a really good example, but also a really terrible example at the same time. But if we weren't out there collecting samples, adopting the stream, this would have been dumped directly into our source water or continued to be dumped directly into it. And the last example I want to share, uh, this is a couple, uh, Ann and Ray Bishop. They're in our watershed. They're actually not on the lake, but way up into it. Again, going back to the theme of creating source water protectors, just building relationships with the community as a public utility. And so they were concerned, they live on a reservoir that was designed uh, when the lake was built to trap sediment. Well, it's been doing its job because of that, it's been getting really shallow and a lot of algae blooms are happening. So they were concerned about the water quality. And this is Kaylee Sim, she was our trainer um, when we first got certified at Anderson Regional. So her and I went out there and met with Anna Ray Bishop, um, I think, I'm sorry, Anna Mark Bishop, and they were just incredible. But if you remember last year, the story, there was uh, dogs that died in North Carolina and Georgia from cyanotoxins. Um, and so for whatever reason, some, I can't remember why or how, Channel 4 reached out to the bishops to ask about it. And so the bishops gave us a call, a heads up, hey, you might not be sure your name. And I know a lot of people were hesitant with media, but we're always embracing opportunity to be able to speak and communicate. So we said, absolutely. So the next day, Channel 4, which is the largest uh, upstate provider to 1.3 million people, was at our plant asking about source water protection. And so this idea of creating source water protectors through a dot stream has led to a lot of other advantages that we never saw. And so that day, we were, I mean, they even took a Facebook Live video on a clarifier. We were able to share about how what we put on the ground into a storm drain does actually not go to a plant. It goes to a creek 
and the lake. So again, just all encompassing our vision of creating source water protectors. So the idea I want to leave everyone here is, you know, what if you created blank amount of source water protectors? Maybe it's 10, maybe you serve 2,000, in Columbia you probably serve hundreds of thousands, wherever you may be, whatever your organization is, what could your watershed look like? You know, what could our cities look like? You know, what could our state look like 30 years from now if we all became source water protectors? And so for us, Adopt a Stream has been very pivotal in our mission to do that. So you can reach out on social. Uh, there's my email. There's my cell phone. You can call or text. But that's pretty much who we are, the Anderson Regional. And Adopt Stream is very helpful for us. So. Thank you so much, Trey. Um, we do, I will go ahead and uh, say that we have, we, a few minutes since Trey does have to leave at 1245, um, we can take a few minutes for any questions for Trey now in the webinar. And this is being recorded, um, so uh, it'll get sent back to Trey if there's questions later and uh, if there's others that you want to share that to. Okay. Um, Trey and I did not compare notes that extensively before this. So it's interesting that you talked about possibilities. Again, you know, what, how does this program serve your vision and the possibilities that you want to create for your stakeholders, for your environment, for your community? And um, I really, really appreciated that 200,000 uh, goal of source water protectors. I think that uh, the utilities are going to be part of the inertia that makes changes happen um, because the communities that are going to be the most successful will have healthy uh, water uh, for a long time to come. So how did you engage the source water protectors? Direct mail, email, phone? That's a question for Trey. Sure, yeah, and I, my longer presentation just goes into detail about that. Um, but we just, uh, one of the ways we also engage the public is we are very open about tours and uh, just me being a resource. So we have uh, the 2019 data, we had over 300 people come to the plant, 30 different groups. And we were in, I think, 60 different classrooms just because teachers are looking for educational opportunities. And then we were in like 20 other events and just random events. But I, we got invited to a job fair just through getting involved with the Chamber of Commerce. Again, nothing to do with water, but through that relationship, uh, they know, hey, there's the water guy. And they had a job fair and we got a free corner booth where every middle schooler from three counties descended upon us. So absolute chaos um, and exhausting, but they had to literally ask us questions for credit. And so we're talking about the water industry, but also source water protection. So um, a lot of it's face-to-face, um, and a lot of it's uh, social media. Again, we we try to re we wanted to really be good on the ground before we started celebrating in the air. If that makes sense. So we didn't want to create this brand that didn't match up to who we were. So we spent a lot of time and spend most of our time kind of on the ground. And then our you'll see us, our social media is not really glossy, but we just kind of take pictures and celebrate what we're already doing because it's kind of something I do on the side. I do multiple different things at the water plant. So uh, that's how we do it. Um, so we don't have direct access to phone numbers and emails because we don't technically, we technically sell to 15 customers, the cities and entities, and they have that contact information. So it's a bit challenging, but hope that answered your question. Okay, how many, um, this is hard, I guess. I think from my perspective, being close to Lake Hartwell Watershed and, and what I see from this program, I feel like your utility, um, doesn't just talk the talk. You're actually out there in the field. You're sampling like other volunteers. Uh, you have your operators that are sampling, your co-op sampling is part of, is part of your, your ethic and your brand. Um, do you feel like you have inspired other monitors um, because of your utilities leadership? I hope, I like to think so. Um... I, yeah, I don't have any you know, proof of that. I do know that um, we did we did send out a direct mail piece. Uh, speaking of direct mail, we targeted every single, it took a lot of work, but just used the tax map and targeted every single homeowner upstream of us on the lake. I think it was like 800 or so. And we're implementing a watershed plan now 
Um, and septic tank repairs is part of that. And so we've had, I think, 10 or 15 projects come because of that. And the mailer wasn't, hey, here's what we're selling or advertising. It was more of just, hey, here's who we are. Here's my number. Call if you have questions. And then we'll send another one next year to kind of follow up. But just really about relationships. Um, and we look, if you thought, so you, we don't have thousands of followers. We just try to engage with the ones we do have and just kind of create this digital campfire, so to speak, that critical mm -hmm. mass. So, yeah, all good terms. And I, I really appreciate your term relational equity. You know, okay. that that direct contact with a person who has questions about their water or is questioning the safety. And when we as adopt a stream uh, produce our annual survey, which is coming out soon, um, that all active monitors and that are in our program will receive this survey asking for feedback. One of the top two motivating factors of why they monitor is concern for the safe supply of drinking water. And um, that's that's always consistently chosen as the first or second uh, largest factor in their reason for monitoring. So a great tie in then, you know, we can't we can't um, fix what we don't measure. Right. How will we get measurable impacts from that? So to know, you know, well, is their concern valid for them to have that hands on experience and know who's monitoring and be part of the community, I think, helps resolve that question of, you know, do they like us? Do they know yeah. what our role is in the community? Do we serve them? And when you're sharing that kind of data, you're working towards some kind of common resolution um, together as a community. Yeah, and so I just have a bad graduated Clemson, but I have a bad worked at a large church in Chick fil A and now I work at a water plant. So it doesn't really make sense, but I'm having a lot of fun along the way. But that's really kind of that servant mindset is what we wanted to embrace while I was hired. Yeah. We respond, you know, I've actually, it's funny today, there's a neighboring entity that has a bull water advisory and uh, people were actually contacting me about it just because they know that it's not a black hole email or they know that even if I don't know, yeah. I'll at least respond. I just, it just goes a lot, you know, because people feel pe just people feel uh, unknown with just negativity and distrust. Yeah. So even so, if it's a, hey, I'll get back to you on that. Oh, they heard me. <laughs> yeah. So and I know it's exhausting because we live in a digital age. Everyone can get a hold of you. But yeah. so you're building way. purpose and rapport yeah. and brand and trust. And, yeah. and that's those are really outcomes that I, I really, you know, I, I hope for. Um, and are difficult to measure. So, but that is very good anecdotal evidence. Well, thank you, Trey. Um, any further questions for Trey? We will email him those questions and he's uh, very famous and going off to a second webinar. <laughs> so, Sorry to be rude. This is not, uh, it's not everyday occurrence. <laughs> that's okay. Right. Thank you, Trey. Yeah. And um, we'll next hear from Josie Newton with Friends of the Reedy River. So um, thanks Josie so much for joining us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as Katie just said, I am Josie. I am the watershed scientist here at Friends of the Reedy River. Um, ben, I actually also grew up in Lexington. Um, so I am from the Midlands um, and grew up there, grew up on Lake Murray, moved to the upstate about eight years ago. And even in just the eight years that I've been around here, I've seen so much progress as it relates to public interest in our rivers and water systems and just in environmental initiatives as a whole and citizen science. Um, yeah, I've, I've been with Friends of the Reedy for only three months and have already also been able to identify how much we utilize the adopt -a stream system to facilitate our three main things of engaging the community, activating the community, and advocating. Um, I will begin sharing my screen in just a moment here. Um, I will turn my video off as well. So. All right, so I hope we're we're good to go um, and sharing my screen and I will start my portion of our time by giving an introduction to the Reedy River and then an introduction to Friends of the Reedy River and then I will delve into the ways in which we utilize the South Carolina adopt -a stream program to educate, advocate and activate our community. Um, we'll again have some time for questions towards the end, so as questions come up, feel free to type them and drop them in the chat. Um, we'll be happy to loop back around to those towards the end here. 
So an introduction to the Reedy River watershed. The top of our watershed begins with spring-fed tributaries up in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. It then flows in a southeastern direction towards downtown Greenville. And then from downtown Greenville goes down towards Lake Conesty, which is actually uh, very close to where I'm sitting right now. Our new office is neighbors with Lake Conesty. So we're really close to right here. Um, and then from there, it goes on down to Boyd's Mill Pond and travels down into the Piedmont region in Lawrence County, where it joins with the Saluda River and enters Lake Greenwood. Lake Greenwood is a man-made lake, which is formed by a dam on the Saluda River in Lawrence County. Um, and that kind of delineates our watershed here. The Reedy River has been an integral part of the upstate of South Carolina for pretty much as long as we can historically track. Um, there's evidence of Catawba and Cherokee Native American tribes calling banks home. And then in the late 1700s, Greenville was officially founded as a mill town on the banks around the Reedy River Falls, which is the area that today we call Falls Park. By the late 1800, these grain mills had been converted to textile mills. And I'll elaborate a little bit more on that in our next slide here. While we are able to boast about how pretty the river is now and use it as a big selling point for Greenville and have it on all of our logos and social media and everything related to the city, it uh, was not so nice pretty recently ago. Um, the Reedy River was considered an eyesore and was treated basically as a receptacle for waste from textile mills in the city. It was even referred to by the locals as the Rainbow Reedy for its tendency to run a different color on any given day, depending on the cover, color of dye or chemical that was dumped in it from these textile mills. So while that seems really fun, it was horrible for the water quality. You can also see um, in this image that it is not a healthy or viable system. Um, got mills directly on the water and a railroad track running through it as well. In addition to the obvious contaminant of the textile dyes, the growing urban population of Greenville led to the construction of a city sewer system in the late 1800s, but for about 30 years there were no treatment facilities. It was just untreated human and industrial waste being discharged directly into the Reedy. Treatment facilities were incorporated in the 1930s, but the issue of unregulated textile and industrial dumping and urban runoff still persisted. Add in further industrialization and urban growth, four-lane bridge called the Camperdown Bridge that covered the falls, so kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, the construction of I-85 and the Army Airport Base led to major sediment and silt deposition into the river and one of the largest inland oil pipeline, sp pipeline spills on record also occurred in Greenville in the Reedy in the 1990s. So the Reedy was heading towards an all-time low. It wasn't until the late 1960s that people were even really starting to have any interest in the health of our hometown river. Um, there's a group called the Carolina Foothills Garden Club along with the city of Greenville and they acquired the land that turned into Falls Park. So it's about 26 acres along our downtown area. Again, this is downtown Greenville. The river runs straight through the heart of our town still to this day. And again, as I was mentioning a minute ago, the Greenville logo prominently features the Reedy River. So it is the pride and joy of our town. However, it was severely neglected for a number of years. And then let's go on here. Today, we're still actively working to correct the historic wrongs. And while chemical loading from textile mills and unregulated waste dumping is not our primary concern anymore, we do still deal with a high load of pollutants in our system. There's sediment, silt, bacteria, phosphorus and nitrogen and litter that are all pollutants we still combat to this day. Friends of the Reedy River tried to step in and help some of this. We were founded in 1993 when two concerned citizens saw the Reedy River and its deeply degraded state and decided to take action by forming Friends of the Reedy River. As you probably have picked up, our focus area is the Reedy River, but it's not just the river itself, it is the entire Reedy River watershed which is a part of the larger Saluda River drainage basin. In the last 28 years, Friends of the Reedy has grown to be a major player in the environmental community of Greenville, South Carolina. We are still the only organization that is solely dedicated to the Reedy River, and we are nearly entirely volunteer driven. I'm actually the only staff member that we have. We have our board members, and then for the rest of it, we rely on volunteers. 
Some of our biggest accomplishments um, have included advocating to have the settlement funds from the colonial pipeline breach, which you can see in the image here, the, the, we're looking downstream from the top of the falls looking downstream. Um, so here going downstream, you can see this yellow um, color to the water that is an effect of the pipeline breach um, in 1996. And we ad advocated to have the funds um, allocated towards restoring the reedy instead of deposited to the state's general fund as the AG initially requested. Um, this sparked the development of many of the upstate's parks, wildlife management areas, conservation easements, and the recovery of the reedy after the oil spill. We've also been instrumental in keeping a mitigation plan in Greenville County rather than in the Midlands or Lowlands after the Southern Connector Toll Road was built in the 90s. This fueled a restoration project on Long Branch Creek, which was integral in repairing the reedy instead of just offsetting the impacts in an entirely different watershed. We also used to hold conservation easements on lands that now make up many parks in the Greenville community and helped acquire the lands that turned into the Swamp Rabbit Trail, um, which is also one of Greenville's main attractions. If you've never been to Greenville and never visited, this is definitely something to keep on your list. We no longer manage the land owner ownership or conservation easements, but it was a big part of our work and it's in Friends' formative years. Um, we were also involved in the removal of the Camperdown Bridge in 2002, so that's an example of our advocacy initiatives and have been influential in the development of Rotary Park, Poinsett Park, Cancer Survivors Park, and many more. In addition to working on projects in our watershed, however, we also serve as an incubator for other nonprofit organizations and protect strategic lands through policy advocacy and through maintaining a presence in the discussions that we're having similar to the ones we're having today um, regarding what we can do, how we can advocate, how we can get other folks to advocate and how we can change policy, especially here in the upstate. Which brings me to exactly what it is that we do. We have three main tenets. The first is to educate the community on the importance of a healthy river system. And as Katie was mentioning initially in her description, what exactly our water system entails. A lot of people don't even know, you know exactly what a watershed is or where their water comes from, or if you put something in the water here, where does it wind up? So we pride ourselves in serving as an organization that educates the Greenville community and not just the Greenville community, the entire watershed community. Um, about the health of our systems. The second thing that we prioritize is advocating for continued and improved protection of the Reedy River. So essentially we're serving as the voice of the river. And fortunately, a lot of people look to us to be the voice of the river. And then the third thing we do is activate our community and equip people to take action. So that is really the biggest step where the adopt a stream program comes into play. Friends of the Reedy's priorities are the conservation and restoration of land along the banks of the river and its tributaries, encouraging watershed management and reducing sedimentation, increasing water quality monitoring, and again, education, the adopt a stream program. And how we utilize that is what I'm going to focus on next. So I will, before we get any farther, I will let you know where it is that we monitor. So this is our watershed kind of spanning from Traveler's Rest on down towards uh, Lake Greenwood. And so any of these monitoring events that are happening in this kind of stretch right here are the ones that pertain to our watershed. Specifically, we have uh, Friends of the Reedy has a monitoring team and it is comprised of me and then one other board member. And we always open up our monitoring outings to the public. So anytime that we go out, it's typically not just me and my cohort, it is me and a group of volunteers. So we love having other people join us, adopt a stream certified or not. And I will tell you where we monitor. So again, I am on the Rewa campus right now. Um, and this is our downstream most point that we monitor. We monitor upstream of the discharge points on Rewa's facility. Rewa is a water treatment facility. Um, and so we test on the Reedy at their campus. We then move upstream to test a tributary to the Reedy River, which is located in Falls Park. We're downstream of the falls and just down slope of the South Carolina Governor's School. So for those of you that are familiar with the area, we're near where they do the Shakespeare in the park and Right in, right in the middle of Falls Park. And then our last site that we monitor on a monthly basis is the Reedy River just downstream and across the river from Swamp Rabbit Cafe and Grocery. Um, so that 
is right around in this area. The adopt a stream program is incredibly appealing to organizations like ours because number one, it is pretty much prepackaged. We don't have to do a whole lot of work on our end as far as the, being the organization using the adopt a stream kit to compile the supplies and find the supplies and figure out what we need to do. That is all readily available for us. We also get to essentially outsource the training for our volunteers. So we welcome the public again to join us for our monitoring outings and they can accompany us without training. But in order to borrow our kit, they must become South Carolina Adopt Stream certified. And that responsibility falls on the certified trainers, not on or our organization. So it really is a huge selling point for us that we don't have to be the ones taking the time to certify our volunteers, although we always do make it clear that they can reach out to us if they have questions. The Adopt a Stream program gives us the tools and resources to engage folks in citizen science without having to put a lot of work in on the front end. One of the only things that we do have to do is um, to equip our volunteers is coordinate the kit pick up and drop off, which is pretty simple to do. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot of time or a whole lot of effort for us to just coordinate that and then keep the kit fully stocked. And we also, you know, while we serve as the point of contact for our group members, as far as questions are concerned, we don't have to answer all of the questions on our own. And so similar to what Trey was saying, you know, if someone contacts us and they're like, I have a question, I don't know what to do. Even if I don't know the answer, I know someone who does. And so it's very nice to know that I can fall back on the support of folks like Katie and Emily. And if we have policy questions or like weird results that come back, I can direct people towards them if I cannot help them immediately. So it's very nice just to have that, that support system to fall back on. It, um, again, is especially appealing to Friends of the Reedy River because um, this allows us to diversify our outreach in a way that is not just litter pickups, which is unfortunately kind of what we fell into being known for. Um, when people in the Greenville area think of Friends of the Reedy River, a lot of times their first thought would be, oh, you're the group that leads river trash litter cleanups twice a year. Um, and while that's great that we are known for that, with the introduction of adopt -a stream people have changed how they interact with us. So when we're doing tabling events or other outreach initiatives, people now come up and say, oh, you do the water quality monitoring stuff, don't you? Which is great. It, it's immediate feedback and direct feedback that the adopt -a stream program is taking off in a way that, that people are now being able to identify us as a group that holistically looks at the water's quality, not just looks at trash removal. So I'll go into now who our stakeholders are. So we have first and foremost, our volunteers. Um, we have about four volunteers that monitor um, and have been monitoring with us for what we consider a long-term basis. And for me, that essentially means they've been doing this longer than I have. Um, I've only been here for three months. So if they've been monitoring well before my time, that is a long-term monitor. Um, and then also the, the idea that they will continue to monitor the same spot on a monthly basis moving forward. Our uh, local communities are also a major stakeholder because as Katie was saying too, and Trey, the people wanna know where their drinking water comes from. People wanna know if it's safe to play in the river. People want to know what the deal is with the water that they are around. And the adopt -a stream kit or program allows us to acquire the, the valuable data that can equip people with accurate information on the safety of their systems in a very, quickly updated manner. So it's not like antiquated data that has been up for a year. It's on a month by month basis. And speaking of safety of water, we also work really closely with local government authorities. So if results come back and something looks wonky, or um, especially if it's the E. coli coliform that is a higher count than it should be, or if it's outside of state standards, or just something that's higher than our uh, volunteers have seen before, especially after retesting, I should mention that as well, we can reach out or advise that our volunteers reach out to their city officials and DHEC to let them know of the abnormal results. We actually had a recent example of this happening. Um, one of our volunteers has been monitoring a site for a number of months now, I'd say probably about six months. And one month he noticed that his bacteria count was higher than it, higher than it should be, higher than usual, but not outside of state standards. 
And so we put him in contact with Emily. They had the discussion and it was like, okay, well, we'll, we'll re-monitor it. We'll check it again, um, go out again in another month as well and just see what we got then. And when he went out for the second time, the E. coli count was even higher and I believe outside of state standards. So at that point, he and I are sitting here talking and trying to figure out, you know, why would that be the case? And he mentions that there has been construction happening upstream and upslope by about probably two or 300 feet. And I was like, okay, so let's help, like, let's connect the dots here and let's figure out what needs to be said to our local authorities. And so through critical thinking on his part, um, him going out and testing regularly, notifying us, we were able to alert DHEC and the city of Greenville of the high E. coli count. Um, and then we also, again, made sure to tell them you know, perhaps this is happening because of a sanitary sewer breach or a connector that's being installed or just because of runoff from the recently tilled up soils. Um, and again, this has happened really, really recently. So we have not received a response that I know of from the city, um, but we do know that we have done our part and that is incredibly valuable because otherwise that would have gone unnoticed. We also, um, I did wanna mention that the city of Greenville does in part help um, financially support us going out and doing monitoring, which is great because it, it shows us that they acknowledge that there are gaps in the data of state monitored waterways and that they recognize that we can help fill in those gaps. And so it, it's great that we have this partnership with the city. And I, I think it's very valuable that, you know, they essentially rely on us to help them collect data that they are not able to collect on their own. And without the adopt stream system, this would be a much more complicated process to initiate. And last, as far as stakeholders are concerned, we have us. Um, again, we, we really strive to be a leader, ed lead educator in our community. Um, and so not only does collecting this data give us the opportunity to use the information to inform future projects or site selection, um, but we can also use it to track changes and inform the public of our results and contextualize this data, um, which I will get to eventually as well, how, how we provide meaning to the numbers. Um, and again, we use the, this to select sites that need extra attention, be that a river cleanup um, or a restoration project, riparian zone replanting, rain gardens, whatever it may be, the data collected can help us select the most at-risk sites in our watershed that need to be our top priority. So how do we share our data publicly? We do wanna be able to share this collected data with the public because if it stays behind closed doors, that doesn't really help us. And so we have, um, at most of our monitoring sites installed these signs. This specifically is the sign um, that is right behind me um, on the Rewa campus here. And as you can see in the photo on the screen, the sign is labeled with the adopt -a stream logo. And then it has the group name and friends of the Reedy River, um, the site name specifically, and then a QR code to access the uh, adopt -a stream online database. Adopt a stream provides the sign design and then sends it as a printable document. So all we had to do was let them know that we were interested in installing the signage and then they sent the document our way. It was our responsibility as a group to have them printed and to ensure that the signs could be placed on our site. So after printing, we then send the signs to the landowner and they're responsible for putting the signage up. We of course coordinate with them, but ultimately it's their responsibility to give us the okay for installing these signs. Um, and just FYI, examples of landowners can include city or county entities, in which case they would be the ones installing the signage, a private landowner, or in our case, Rewa. Our hope is that these signs reach people who might not otherwise know about adopt -a stream or our organization, and that if people are familiar with adopt -a stream they can easily access the data for that site. We try to position the signs in places where they're um, is high pedestrian traffic. So places that are frequently walked by, but that would not cause a traffic jam if someone were to stop and look. Um, so in some cases it may make more sense to place the signs closer to the water if that's where people are going to be, or even in the water if that's where people are going to be. For this site specifically, there's a, a walking path that runs through the campus. People go to and from meetings every day. This is the window I look out, so I know people are passing by it. Um, and it, it we want it to have it where people can see this, walk by it, scan the QR code, get access to the data, get involved if they want to. 
Um, and regardless of the details of where we place the signs, we just try to put it where it's readily accessible public locations with high visibility. The goal of these signs, aside from just informing the public about the existence of our water quality monitoring, is to create a sense of local identity and ownership over the health of our water systems. The more we can involve people in the community in our process, the more invested they will be, and then the more personal ownership they'll also feel towards the health of our watershed. So that's really how you start activating people. Now, while the signs might help us distribute the data, there's no context added when folks head to the database and see these numbers. So this is where it becomes really important for us and organizations similar to us to provide context and analysis of these numbers. You can see here an example of an email that I sent out to our listserv. We have a group specifically of folks who are interested in uh, water quality monitoring. So these might be people who have volunteered with us before or who have simply indicated that they are interested in knowing more about it. After we conduct our monitoring, we send this email out. It contains the data from our three sites, as well as the two other sites that are monitored by another Friends of the Reedy Associated volunteer who has his own kit. And then we give a brief analysis of this data. We try to point out that states are within state, or excuse me, that the results are within state standards, assuming that is in fact the case, fingers crossed. Um, and then we explain why any of the three monitored results may differ from the last month to the present month. We also share a shortened version of this blurb onto our social media accounts. Um, and we've even actually received responses to, or like replies to our emails of people commending us and complimenting us for providing this context. So it's definitely something that's important. It's definitely something that we will continue to do. And that has been an improved, excuse me, has been proven to be impactful to our volunteers and interest groups. So now at this point, you might be wondering, how do we even get people to volunteer with us? And that again is in the newsletter and social media posts that we put out. We always include either a link of how to join us or sign up for our email list or indicate that we allow volunteers to join us on the next monitoring outing. Um, after we have selected a date for our monitoring outing, we also publish that on social media and send out an email um, to the same listserv. We typically have you know, one volunteer join us at least per outing, but sometimes have three, four, or five people join depending on the availability of the folks who want to come. Um, usually these are people who are trying to see if becoming a drop to stream certified is of interest to them, or people who have not been able to get into a training class yet due to conflicts in their own schedules, or people who have gone through the adopt to stream training course but want a little bit more individualized opportunity to sample in the field before heading out and sampling on their own. We always in these posts and emails emphasize that in order to join us, people don't have to be certified. They're welcome to join regardless of their skill level. And I think that that is something that really helps make us accessible to the public. And it's a great kind of casual way for people if they are interested in Friends of the Reedy or interested in the Reedy River or interested in their water or just interested in science or whatever it may be. It's an easy way to make ourselves accessible to the public on a much more intimate level than our big river cleanups or some of the tabling events where it's a lot busier. Um, so we have great conversations with our volunteers and honestly really truly enjoy it. So that kind of brings me into what we've gained from utilizing the Adopt-A-Stream program to engage our watersheds community. It helps us meet our goals of educating, advocating, and activating our community by providing opportunities to educate and engage our community that then produce actionable results. We educate through our newsletter and social media posts and the conversations that we have with our volunteers, as I was just mentioning, those are so valuable. We engage our community by inviting everyone out to, enjoy, to join us and then installing the signage that provides easy access to the data. And then we achieve actionable results in the form of that data incorporate our findings into future projects and site selection, uh, fill gaps in that state monitored water quality monitoring, or, I just messed that sentence up, state monitored water quality monitoring, um, and find areas where policies may need to be improved or where impacts are being made and not detected. For example, that construction project that was evidently stirring up some E. coli. Um, Adopt stream, as I touched on earlier, helps us diversify our outreach options. We aren't just a group that specializes in litter cleanups as our only outreach and engaging activity. And it's great to have a tool that is so easily accessible that allows us to reach an entirely different audience and engage our members of our community who might not want to do a litter cleanup. 
Um, it's also been a great tool for our volunteers who have kids. Uh, I have a volunteer that has been monitoring with us for a long time and she has four young sons and she brings most all of them, I think, except maybe the baby baby one, um, but she brings them out with her as her little assistants while they're doing monitoring. And some of them are also involved in a Boy Scout troop and she plans to bring them out to watch her do her water quality monitoring, which is a really cool and fun way to engage kids at a young age in, in science and showing that it's cool and it's fun and you, know, you get to use the little bottles and whatever else. Um, but it's also a great way to show that the value of volunteering to young kids. Um, so this is, you know, something that if they were to want to do it on their own, probably middle school age and up would be best, but little kids can come out and enjoy it as well. I actually was able to talk to one of my neighbor's grandchildren about this too, and her eyes just lit up. She thought it was so cool. And then the biggest thing that Adopt Stream program offers for Friends of the Reedy, again, is just the opportunity for us to um, foster learning by letting our volunteers join us. Adopt a stream certified or not for our outings and then helping answer their questions. It's just super accessible. We're really, it's easy to have a good conversation with people while you're out doing this. And it's easy to answer their questions as they come up about our watershed. And then in doing this, we are also able to place Friends of the Reedy River in a leadership position within the Greenville community. And it puts us in a position to alert regulatory authorities to problematic results or areas with consistently problematic data. And we, it, it helps us gain a reputation for people who not just talk about the river, but also acquire that data on our own. And so kind of to, to close out here, um, I'd like to conclude by sharing how successful we've been in the incorporation of this. Um, we have those four volunteers who have monitored with us for a long time. I have two folks who are trying to join us in the near future. Um, and I have exciting news and I'm excited, excited to share that we will uh, be adding a second chemical and bacteria monitoring kit to our, our office. So we will be able to reach out to even more folks. Um, I also recently became macroinvertebrate trained um, and would love to add that because I think that that'll bring in an entirely different group of people as well. Um, yeah, I hope that that'll be something that we'll be able to add to our plate sometime next year and use as a way to continue to use Adopt-A-Stream to engage our community. Um, and with that, I know that I'm closing out on our time here, so I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Katie. Um, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Josie. That was a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anything I don't believe in the chat room directed towards you. So um, if anyone has any questions, please enter them there. Or I can actually allow you to speak if you'd like. Um, I'll just uh, quickly recap that. You touched on a lot of the themes of what the ADOPT acronym is. And the ADOPT acronym is being active, collecting data, being outdoors, preserving and protecting resources together. And so a lot of the things that you talked about that you showed in images uh, um, kind of, you know, bring those uh, different themes, program themes to, to light and into action. Um, so um, you also have uh, two other things too. I think just I was, I was thinking about it, you have, um, in our database, there is the opportunity where someone uh, selects that there's a, a, pardon me, a certified volunteer recognizes that there's been littering occurring that can be used as a tool to identify potential cleanup locations uh, because you were talking about cleanup. So kind of one program, outreach program feeding into another and that you all for the first time will have an award at your annual meeting for the um, most active volunteer uh, in your watershed. So another way to kind of build your audience and recognize how you lift each other up in this community dedicated towards conservation and preservation. Um, I'm gonna jump into just two final examples before we close out the webinar. So I'll go ahead and just uh, share my screen here. Um, I just wanna promote that uh, the Friends of Lake Kiwi Society, are um, they are becoming a hub uh, up on Lake Kiwi. This is uh, the lake, it's you know in between Lake Jocassi and Lake Hartwell um, in the Savannah River Basin. Um, it is a huge uh, important water supply. 
uh, not only for the area around Lake Kiwi, but also transferring water to the city of Greenville. They um, just launched a scholarship program for high school juniors um, that could apply for the scholarship. And then if awarded, that's a $2,500 award sent directly to the uh, student's college. They in turn have to monitor, become a certified volunteer monitor for six months. Uh, so that is, is brand new. Another kind of new way, even though Friends of Lake Kiwi Society does a lot, Friends of Reedy River does a lot, just another example of, of supporting this effort or using this effort to promote better and more conservation and more community building uh, towards your goals. Also, um, Lake Hartwell Partners for Clean Water is a new initiative to um, protect and, and improve the watersheds that are leading to Lake Hartwell. Again, a huge uh, drinking water source as Trey identified. And uh, this group is developing a business partnership with local businesses that can have displays or offer discounts to certified volunteers. Um, we are out of our time. So I'm going to leave this on the final screen. I hope I'm not making anyone car sick um, to stay connected with us. Uh, Josie, um, thank you so much for sharing Friends of Reedy River's story. I think a lot of people will find those ideas very interesting and adaptable to their own agencies and organizations. I um, mean, please follow us on uh, Facebook or find us on Instagram. Uh, follow hashtag SCAAS or SC Adopt a Stream. You can find more on our website, sign up for our e news, find a local event to you uh, near you. And please let us know any questions that you have. I hope that we will similarly run this webinar in a year uh, talking about saltwater impacts. That's a very new program for us, just a few months old, um, but it is launched. We do have a saltwater component and I hope that we can have similar uh, wider ripple effects from citizen science monitoring along our coastal waterways. Um, so thank you for joining us and I hope to see you on a future webinar. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Josie, great work. You can you can turn off your mic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's still there's still a few people on. Thank you, John. Thank you, Melanie. Oh, I miss Daria's. Is she still on? She's not. Yeah, I was just checking to see if she was. She's not. I'm a city that has engaged their citizens with the Adopt a Stream program. Ah, by lovely ladies. Um, we can talk with her about the city of Greer, probably would be, and and maybe Rock Hill. Um, mm -hmm. but that would be as a Daria is the stormwater manager in Easley. That's a great question from her perspective, and the city of Clemson is the other one really close to home that puts out a newsletter article that includes adopt -a stream has sites available for adoption. So we can follow up with her, one of us. But um, we actually, we held on to everybody for a really long time. I know you were like in the thick of it, Josie, but we had 22 participants oh, wow. to start and we ended at 22 participants. We had a <laughs> Uh, so for some reason, it dipped down to 19, and then it went back up to 22, uh, <laughs> as far as what I was paying attention to. So I think you did, you really did wonderful. I know you kind of get lost in, right, your own, like, no one is who's here, who's here with me, <laughs> kind of feelings. Um, you did wonderful. Thank yeah, you. A lot of talking. I don't normally talk that much. <laughs> it is. <laughs> no, it is. I Oh, go ahead. No, no, I disagree. <laughs> we all are gonna like ah, come decompress after this. <laughs> I actually um, was notified right before this that my boyfriend hit a deer on I-85. So oh. that was also in the back of my head. And I was just like, oh no, that's not is he okay. He's okay. His car is not, but he is. So oh, it's the yeah. full hunter's moon. So all the deer are out. We have actually a few deer on our road right now, which always scares me. Yeah. Um, I just want to see if this, uh, Richard, do you want, um, are you on still? Yes. Okay, if you have any questions, I, 
I've handed you the microphone since you're still with us. Okay. I'm a, a longtime member of the Isaac Walton League of America National yes. Conservation Group. We have a, 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 a thing called the Clean Water Hub. This is assembling data from all over the United States where anybody can look and see what kind of water mon monitoring activities and what the water quality is in various places around the country. I would dearly like to see South Carolina sites in input into this database. And I, I emailed to Sam, uh, Samantha Briggs, who's our clean water program uh, director at the Isaac Walton League in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland. I emailed her the link to the seminar. I don't know if she, or the webinar. I don't know if she was able to get in on this or not. Okay, but um, <clears throat> anyway, um, I did make that a, uh, make her aware of that. Um, I have also passed along IWLA.org, the Isaac Walton website, to Amanda Gladys at Wahala High School, who is the um, main recipient right now. They're, they're establishing a library of water monitoring kits through a grant from folks. Um, to do water monitoring in the Oconee County and, and uh, that, that area of the, um, the watershed for Lake Kiwi. So I'm highly interested in everything that's going on here, but I'm really trying to, to push, to push, to push, to try to get people to include South Carolina data in the Clean Water Hub. And I really thank you for the opportunity to say so. I thank you, Richard. Um, Samantha did register. And she noted that she's interested in data sharing. We can follow up with her. I don't know if she was on the attendees list. I'd have to look. Um, I just but, told about. I just told her about it last night.